dedicate weeks to going to coding boot camps at General Assembly. And we spend nights taking Excel classes on Coursera. We go to marketing conferences to boost our professional hard skills. But how much are we actually investing in our relationship skills at work? I've worked with many companies, and I've been amazed how they have moonshots about just about everything. A moonshot on the future of food, of the environment, of education, of cybersecurity, of transportation, of health. None about the future of relationships. Well, perhaps we want to reevaluate where we invest our time and our resources, given that 65% of startups fail because the relationship between the co-founders busts. You know, no amount of money or purpose or even free food can compensate for a poisonous relationship at work. So tell me, how many of you, raise your hands, have ever experienced a hard relationship situation at work? <laughs> right. Now, keep them up. <laughs> and how many of you remember that night where you sit there and you ruminate and fret about that person that makes you miserable while they are sleeping perfectly fine? <laughs> now tell me, how many of you thought that you may be part of the problem? A few honest people. Okay. You know, I'm a psychotherapist, and I work with people from all over the world for the past three and a half decades. And you may have heard me say that it is the quality of our relationships that determines the quality of our lives. But it's equally so that the quality of our relationships at work determines the actual quality of our work and our overall ability to succeed. But unlike performance, relationships are harder to measure, harder to sustain, and harder to repair. So, today, I would say that our professional lives demand an entirely new skill set for relational intelligence. And by in relational intelligence, I mean this our ability to connect with others, how we establish trust and overcome betrayal, how we engage in conflict or avoid it. It is those inner stories that determine the way that we communicate to elicit curiosity and collaboration. Now, a few years ago, a business conference would have focused on production, efficiency, processes, performance, the bottom line. Relationships would have been considered soft skills. And you know, soft skills, they're re feminine skills. And feminine skills, people love to idealize them in principle, but disregard them in reality. Today, relationships have fast become the new bottom line. So, It reflects an important change that I see happening in our society. There's an enormous restlessness at this moment, an anxiety about how we relate to one another, about how we deal with disagreement and with breaches of trust in the workplace. How did we get there? I see a parallel between two relationship revolutions, one at home, and one at work. And I want to highlight three aspects of these parallel changes. First, the rise of expectations. Never before have we expected so much from our partners, and never before have we expected so much from our work. Number one, we want our partners to be one person for everything, a best friend, a confidant, 
an intellectual equal, a co-parent, and the one who's going to help us become the best version of ourselves. But we want from work an enormous amount of flexibility so that it will adapt itself to the particularities of our life. We want our work to be attentive to our physical and emotional well-being. And we want our jobs to help us find a sense of purpose and meaning in what we do. When it comes to our intimate relationships, we want all of this for the long haul from our partner, and that long haul keeps getting longer. But when we look at our work life, we are hopping from one gig to the next. And we still have these heightened expectations. If you look at the second aspect of this parallel relationship revolutions, it's the role of emotions. We have basically brought market economics into our personal lives, what sociologist Eva Illouz calls emotional capitalism. We talk about our intimate relationships in terms of supply and demand. We talk about it as if we have gotten a good deal, as if this is not the bargain that I striked. You know, this is not what I bargained for. That's the correct English expression, if I'm not mistaken, you know? And at the same time, we also have a form of romantic consumerism where a date can pretty much look like a job interview. You've been at those? I won't ask you to raise your hand. <laughs> but you know if you've been at those. At the same time, we are also bringing emotions into the workplace. Emotions that used to be the scourge of business. You know, now it's tied to performance. We talk about authenticity and belonging and trust and empathy and transparency. We basically are using in the same breath psychological safety and performance review. That's a revolution. And then the third aspect of these changes has to do with how we have shifted from a production economy to a service economy, both at work and at home. Look at it. We used to have sex in order to have kids, and we needed to have kids in order to have more hands to work the land. Today, we have sex that is rooted in desire for pleasure and connection. That's a service economy. <laughs> we used to work and go to the factory in order to, bre to have bread on the table. But now we go to work for personal fulfillment and purpose and identity development. That's a service economy. In sum, if you look at it carefully, work and love are basically using the same vocabulary. So let me ask you, how many of you would say that in the last three years, you have been on more than one date? Raise your hand. Can I get more light in the room, please? <laughs> no, I like to know who I'm speaking to. Perfect. How many of you would say that you have been dating more than one person at the same time? How many of you have had more than one job in the last three years? And how many of you have been having more than one job at the same time? Listen, people, I have news for you. Goodbye, monogamy, and welcome to the polyamorous world of work. We used to leave a marriage because we were unhappy, and now we leave marriages because we think we could be happier. But we used to leave a job because the factory closed, and now we leave our jobs because we feel that we are not being properly recognized or promoted fast enough, or that our identity is being stunted. Recognition and appreciation trump salary, and both of these are interpersonal dynamics. There's a recent Mercer survey, which really caught my attention, because it talked about how it emphasizes how much people today at work want to be treated like human beings. And it occurred to me that it's ironic that the very same work culture 
that is digitalizing everything, creating chatbots for customer care, doing a virtual onboarding, that the very same people, basically, that are building robots would like at work not to be treated as such. That's ironic. So, let me ask you something. Would you please stand up if you were born in a country outside the United States? Can I get a little bit more light, please? Wow. Wow. Now, watch. How many of you are working in a language that is different from your native tongue? Stay standing. And for those of you who are working with the people who work in a foreign language, I know that you realize how important it is to acknowledge the effort that it takes to work in translation, especially when the other side is doing something which we ourselves could never do. Empathy goes a long way. Thank you. Please stand up. There's a few coming, as you can imagine. I'm getting into it just now. <laughs> if you've ever censored yourself in a conversation and failed to speak up because you feared criticism or judgment, but it still haunts you today, stand up. Wow. Wow. You know, I was with Brene Brown two days ago listening to her talk in New York, and she talked about how she has regrets sometimes. And she talked about how many of her regrets are sometimes a failure of kindness. Take that in. Thank you. And stand up if you have ever let somebody take that you've done. <laughs> but here's the additional question. To the women, raise your hand. Do you have a sense that this happens to you more often if your counterpart is a man? To the men, do you have a sense that this happens more often if your counterpart is a woman? No, mostly not. <laughs> Maybe one or two, but watch the difference. And someday somebody has to interpret this for me. Or I will, but it will take some time. Stand up, thank you. Stand up if you've ever blamed yourself for something that was not your own mistake. So look, here's the way I sometimes think of it. In relationships, you will sometimes see that there are certain people, nothing is ever their fault. It's always somebody else or some external circumstance. And then you have other people who seem to take everything on their shoulders and blame themselves for everything, even when it's not their own doing. And what's interesting about this is that both of these reactions share a similar grandiosity. In one situation, you are oh so fantastic, and in the other, you are oh so terrible. But both share the same hint of narcissism. Thank you. Stand up if there is someone that you owe an apology to. <laughs> and take a moment just to say the name of that person out loud. 
And then just look to the person next to you and just utter the first words of the first sentence so that you can hear yourself out loud. And maybe that person is actually sitting next to you, who knows? <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Let me ask you another one, last one maybe, or one more, we'll see. Stand up. If you are among those people who bring the best of you to work and bring the leftovers home. So, you understand people, this is not good. <laughs> And stand up, last one, I think. If the last thing that you stroke before going to bed is your phone. <laughs> and stand up if the first thing you stroke in the morning when you wake up is your phone. <laughs> and do you think there's anything wrong with that? These situations, they all require relational intelligence. Now, as a couples therapist, I have found that every relationship deals with three main aspects. Autonomy and interdependence, conflict management and communication, and self-awareness and accountability. And I want to run these three with you. I'm going to run, ask you to scan your personal history, or in other words, your relational resume. Because each of us grows up in a relational culture, at home, at school, in our communities, and in the larger political, economic, and social system that we live in. We all carry narratives with beliefs about what we can expect from people. And all these narratives, they form the lens through which we look at our relationships at work as well. So take a moment and listen and rethink about some of the messages that you may have grown up with. Were you raised with the idea that relationships are central or more so that relationships are secondary and peripheral? In the first script, you are probably taught, you know, relationships are at the heart of our life. They give us nurturance, they support us, they sustain us. Kiddo, you are never alone in this world. There will always be someone to help you because it is safe to trust. And if that's your script, you more likely have an ability to engage with loyalty and collaboration. May I ask how many of you send a portion of your paycheck home every month? That is loyalty. But if you are raised with the idea that relationships are secondary because you are the center, because in the end you are alone in this world, there's only you you can rely upon, nobody is there to help you. And you often are more likely to be the person who does everything. And who does everything because you think that nobody else would do it. And if they did it, they wouldn't do it as well as you. And so you resent them for doing it, but you don't want to delegate because they would never do it in the way that you would do it. And so here you are. <laughs> you know that person? <laughs> we don't magically become different people when we enter the door of our office building, you know? So, Last year, I played a piece of my podcast, Where Should We Begin? And it's a podcast in which I explore the intricacies of intimate relationships. By the way, we have just released a trailer in our feed for season three. So, but the big news is that I'm working on a new podcast about relationships in the workplace. 
And for that matter, people, if there's anything that you would like to hash out, and with me present, we are currently taking applicants, and you can go on the podcast page on my website. But I want to play you a clip, and you are basically the first audience to ever hear this. It is a session with two co-founders who both had bad breakups in the way that they left their jobs, professional breakups. And they both come together to discuss trust. Let's listen. There's no doubt that your emotional and relational dowry comes with you to work. I love to ask the question always, you know, were you raised for loyalty or were you raised for autonomy? What would you say? When I'm being true to my nature, I think the answer is loyalty. But my upbringing and my family was definitely autonomy. Do it yourself. Don't depend on anybody. And you would say? I don't think it was a conscious effort on, on my, my mother's part to raise me to be anything but self-sufficient. Um, my mom had no choice. My mom worked. My parents divorced when I was really young. My mom moved all the way across the world, and we lived in Hawaii. We moved so much in my childhood. I went to three schools in just first grade alone. It seemed sometimes pointless to make friends. So the relationship that I have that I feed and maintain and maintain me, I've made it work. And I'm very loyal, I think, as, as, a, as a friend and a colleague. Um, but when you are raised to the degree that you were for a time, you can imagine the stakes when you allow yourself to rely on others. They're high. Even if you look at the work that I do, um, I like to wear all the hats in, in my job. I like to do every single thing on a project. Right, and many people who are raised for autonomy have a harder time delegating they rely on themselves. If they have a problem, they try to solve it alone. They may have more trust issues. As in, simply, I've, don't, I've never really learned what it's like to rely on other people and to think that they're gonna come true and they're gonna be there and they're gonna show up and they're gonna do it as well as I would. Right. That's the other piece, of course, because otherwise I may just do it myself, right? You know, you're probably going to like a team of other people who are all self-motivators, self-starters. You know, on the other end, people who are raised for loyalty are more likely to tell you when they struggle with something. Right. That's not going to be the one who's going to hide it for two months, trying to figure it out alone because they're too embarrassed to let you know that they don't know how to do something. Right. Clearly, our personal experiences seep into our work lives, how we manage and are managed. Are you secure in giving your reports freedom or do you micromanage them and keep them close to home? Do you seek feedback or do you shun it because you anticipate criticism rather than support? And trust, do you trust your team and your manager and do you know how to elicit trust from them? You know, trust is that foundational truth that says that others are there for you when you take risks and you are vulnerable. That's why when trust is broken, it shatters all our assumptions about the relationship and about our value in it. Now, every living organism, every relationship, every company, every organization, every system straddles commitment and freedom, stability and change, togetherness and individuality. And what you will find is that often in one relationship, and you can track it right back to the autonomy and loyalty. You have one person who is more in touch with the fear of losing the other, and one person who is more in touch with the fear of losing themselves. One person more afraid of abandonment, one person more afraid of suffocation. The first person often eager to please and quick to give in, and the other person often way too stubborn to give in. Check, scan as we speak right now. We have autonomy or we have an interdependence, but we also have conflict management. And here's the thing, every relationships 
you will have communication that is explicit and communication that is implicit. The stuff that we talk about, where we should schedule the meeting, what kind of meeting it should be, who is promoted, why they shouldn't be promoted, and then you have everything that's underneath. And what's underneath can often be brought together under three themes. It's this, power and control. What are we really talking about? Power and control. Whose priorities matter and who gets to make the decisions? Or closeness and care, as in, do we have each other's back and are we in this together? Or care and recognition. Do you appreciate me and do you value me? I would suggest that underneath most relational impasses, this is the real stuff that is actually being discussed. It isn't so much what is being talked about as it is what is being evoked between the people. And self-awareness and accountability. That's the one I really want to play with you for a moment. You know, as a couples therapist, I have often noticed that when people come to see me, they don't really come to tell me what's wrong with them. <laughs> they actually are expert on what's wrong with their partner and they say, fix it. <laughs> actually, I've often thought that couples therapy was a drop-off center. <laughs> but the same thing happens also at work, right? The golden rule is this. If you want to change the other, start by changing yourself. Because relationships, they are actual feedback loops in which we make the other and the other defines us, back and forth. It's this phenomenal dance that we call the more, the more. The more I get agitated and I become all stressed out and I start to yell at you and the more you have the tendency to recoil and to go and shut down and just kind of protect yourself from me. And the more you do that and the more I think you don't want to hear and the more I start to expand even more and I come even more after you. And the more I come after you and the more you become like a mouse. And the more you become like a mouse and the more I become like a lion. You know that dance? The more, the more. So my suggestion as we take a final pulse check here, before we start our conversation, is this. When this happens to me, I have to make a real effort to think, what is it that I brought to this situation? Because I can be just as quick at coming up with all the shortcomings of the others. And I have to remind myself, if I want to change the other, I start by changing myself. Thank you very much. So, let's turn the lights on yet a little bit more and talk together. Who is going to, this is going to be? You can ask me a question, but the question has to have a question mark at the end. <laughs> if it becomes a veiled statement, I will unveil it. And then we'll take a few maybe at the same time so that we can see what are the themes, what speaks to you here, what are you grappling with, what are your pain points. Let's go. There are mics, I guess, all the way in the aisles. Go ahead. Um. I am a sociologist, yes. and I, I work in a technology company, and yeah. I work with a lot of engineers. And I'm wondering if you have any insights about how what you spoke about applies to relationships with engineers. <laughs> <laughs> engineers here by present, stand up. <laughs> I will come back to it. OK. Yes, next. I'm going to take a few and just see. Yep. How do you know how long you should try being the change in the difficult relationship or if it's a toxic environment to get out of? If there's one person in your organization that is the source of a lot of, of pain, 
How do you avoid, how do you help? And if you hadn't used this nice word, what would you have said? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, if there's this one person, how do you help them as their manager without turning it into a everyone gangs up against them? Great questions. Wow, nice. Yes. Hi, um, when you know that there's something that both people know that there's something that they need to talk about, but you are kind of doing everything possible to avoid it and pretend like everything is fine and that isn't a problem. What, what is the best way to start that conversation? Great, great. Shall, shall I, we start a moment with this just so we don't... Uh, so, I'm going to actually start with the last one. You know, what do you do when you are avoiding talking about something and you know that I know that you know that I know. <laughs> and I think probably one of the best things is to do the meta communication. It's to say, have you noticed how good we are at never bringing this up? And it's a we, that's the important piece. It's you kind of identify the marker of the avoidance itself because it's no point in bringing up the subject since the subject is <laughs> being tucked underneath. So you, you, you highlight, we're doing something. What do you think this is about? You know, do you think that we are afraid that this would create a major rift between us, that we just, this would dismantle the, the, com the company, that uh, we have such different visions that we don't want to see that we do, that we realize that there is no way we can work on this project together? What is the fear that the honesty is trying to protect? That's the question. It's the consequence of the conversation that we're trying to avoid. And that's why we're avoiding the conversation altogether. The conversation is just something that leads to consequences. Does that make sense? I need to see you, but since I don't have my glasses, you have to talk to me. <laughs> you know? Um, what do you do when there is one person um, and that actually could go back to the first question as well, in terms of how do you know how long you want to try and how long you work and you, when, when, when you, before you give up and you say this may not change. Sometimes these two are actually related, right? Um, here's the thing. There, there is what you can do as a manager and then there is the resources that you offer people to go and seek help and education in other places. There's a, every, every profession has its limits of what it is allowed to, what territory it is allowed to enter. But the idea is really this. I know that you would love to succeed at this. I know that you have tried very hard to communicate something about this. I know that you often think that you're the only one that stays here past nine o'clock. Basically, you start with an I acknowledge you in your truth, in the way you probably see things, by the way, even if I think you're completely distorted. You don't have to agree with any of it, but you have to be able to think and to see the perspective of the other. Now, I may be the one that is trying to say this is never gonna work, and I have a way of saying it that makes nobody wanna listen to me. I don't know if that's a similar situation to the one. But the idea is there is a difference between the intention and what is actually being done. So the intention may be okay, but the way it's being done is disastrous. And then you separate those two things. I have a sense that what really matters to you is this, but I've also noticed that when you do it, let me ask you, do you think that the way you do it has yielded the results that you wanted? Now, sometimes on that question, you're gonna get all the things that other people do wrong. And when you get somebody who blames everybody else for everything, what you also need to know is that people's sense of perfection is often rooted in the fact that they have such shame about not being perfect. Do you get that? So, sometimes it, it reminds me of this beautiful definition of self-esteem, which my colleague Terry Realtor gave me, which says this, self-esteem is your ability to see yourself as a flawed individual and still hold yourself in high regard. It's not about being beyond reproach or flawless or perfect. You try that approach first. 
You don't bring in the troops. You don't start saying other people have said. Other people also agree. I can give you many examples beyond the one I just gave you now. You know, you don't bring in the troops because then you basically are shaming people. And when you shame people, unfortunately, it doesn't matter how right you are, it's useless. So that's the beginning of what you do when you want to help somebody who can affect an entire system. And you are absolutely right to, with the first question. One person can pretty much spoil an entire system. One, like one virus, like one thing that starts to affect everything. And it starts to create splits, and it starts to create lies, and it creates triangulations, all kinds of situations you know, that basically make being at work a place where everybody is looking over their shoulder. In terms of the engineers, <laughs> you know, I think the, 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 what, what I, I'm imagining is this. All relationship systems are made up of complementary parts, meaning that people have roles and these roles complement each other. The engineers are doing what the engineers are doing because those are the skills that they can master, which are often the very skills that other people can't do for the life of them. So let them be engineers, but surround them with people who can translate for them. Surround them with people who can speak a language that other people can actually understand. Surround them with people who are not afraid to look at you in the eyes because they don't experience that as such an intimidation. And let them know that, this is in, that those people need them and they need the others. Rather than having places that are completely homogeneous, defined by one, not just skill set, but also personality type. Does that make sense? Yes, ask me. Can we get a little bit more light, please? Again? Just so I, so I go ahead. Hi. Um, so you spoke about romantic relationships and workplace relationships. Do you have any tips for people who are in a workplace relationship? <laughs> ah, yes. You mean where the two of them have come together? Uh, yes, I happen to be in a relationship with someone I work with. Yes, yes, yes. I understood. <laughs> You know what's very funny is that I spent the entire time thinking, how am I going to say this thing about relationships at work without people thinking that I'm thinking about love relationships in the workplace? But now you finally asked me the real question. Okay. <laughs> yes. Hi, Esther. In an organization that requires collaboration, how do you instill trust, decrease fear, so that creativity can happen? Say that again. Need to instill trust. Yes. Decrease the fear so that people who need to be collaborative can do that creatively. Uh -huh. And where, what is the situation right now? Uh, high distrust, high fear. Because? Because I just don't think people trust each other. So yes, there's yes, a lot yes, of, but why? That's a good, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, go underneath. Power and control, closeness and care, or recognition? Those three. OK. Which one? Is it about power, about trust, or about integrity? I think it's probably a bit about power and, a, and the trust. OK. So the idea being, if I try something and it doesn't work, there's no safe way for me to do this and to come and say, I really wanted to check this out. So in the end, I'm only going to check out this, which, that which I am kind of sure is going to happen, but right, that safe. which I'm kind of sure is rather narrow because it's already established. That's right, safe. And as my mentor used to say, certainty is the enemy of change. You have to be able to be confused and to not know in order to be able to explore the unknown and become creative. How do you instill that, though, in an organization? Well, you look at who blocks it okay. as well. You start, I'm going to come back to that. OK, so we have the romantic relationship, and we have the stunted relationship. <laughs> yes? If you're in an interview or you're a business owner trying to convince someone to hire your company versus another one, how do you address some of those soft skills that I think are so valuable but very hard to quantify? Come, come a little closer to the mic. How, yeah. how do you address the soft skills 
that are hard to quantify, even in kind of the engineering example. Surround them by a community of people that understand how to speak their language and also communicate it to other, other people who may not understand. That's a, in my opinion, that's a yes. soft skill. Yes. But how do you prove to someone that you have it? And how do, you, how do we start to talk about the importance of that? Yep. Okay, let me do this three. Um, look, may I ask you something? The lady who talked about your romantic relationship at work, is it official? <laughs> that changes the whole answer. Where are you? Huh? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So, I mean, look, the bottom line is that if one day you break up, you probably won't work in the same place. That's just that's the final end of that. But what happens is this. There's a very, it's a complicated situation. Where else should people meet these days? But in the place where they are spending 10 or 15 years before they even enter a committed relationship. You know, if the only place left is the app, right? So um, they, at the same time, the notion often is that people, you know, if they go, if they have a romantic relationship, then they are maybe less serious or they have coalitions or they, they, they share secrets with each other that other people do not know and all of that. It all depends a little bit on the place you are, the level of transparency that you have. You know, if you work in a family business, it's actually quite known. They, you know, they, we talk, there's a difference if you are in a company that is owned by two people who also live life together, or if you are in a family business, or if you are in a large company. That romantic relationship will have a very different space that it inhabits, depending on the nature of the company. But as a whole, um, it's always been this way. There is absolutely nothing new that people will meet in the workplace and that that is the place from which so many families launched. At this point, it's tricky because we are in an environment that really, and this goes right back to the question that you asked about the soft skills, which really I would like if it's possible to take the word soft out of it. Because otherwise we have this idea that there is hard skills and it's called data fundamentalism. And then there is the soft skills, which is the, you know, that. That's kind of the body motion that goes with it. When in fact, you know, these are highly important intuitive skills, highly important skills that allow people to work together, to trust each other, to be creative, all the stuff that was actually included in the question about how do we open this up here and make this a safe place for people to try things out. Basically, the first thing you do about those skills these days, and it's very difficult, and it's probably even more difficult if you are a woman and you're pitching to men, is to really not be apologetic about it, and to just be very confident that those are really crucial. And you know what? Ask these people if they have children. And if they have children, I promise you that they have told their children that those are very crucial values. It's just that they compartmentalize it. Here you have to behave one way, and here you don't need to think about these things at all. It's really much more integrated. You know, how you, how you, how you acknowledge people, how you make them feel valued, how it, all of it, all of that stuff. But there's a real issue about it being soft, about it being coming from a woman, and about it being in a place that highly values data. You know, it's the God, the worshiping of the God data. It won't last. Because every time something goes into an extreme, at some point there's going to be a type of self-correct. I don't know which one, but I know that on some level, it's the same thing about why do you think that people, this is why this Mercer survey was so critical to me, that so many people are saying that they want to be treated like human beings. Never in the 50s did people want flexibility and, and, and places where they can attend to their emotional well-being and meditation rooms and a sense of fulfillment in the work, all of that stuff. We want to be humanized desperately at the very same time that we are creating a society that is way too often dehumanizing. And the data is a part of that. So now you go back to your meetings and you tell them some version of this. I heard this crazy lady with an accent. 
And uh, <laughs> she set me up for this. It's not me, I'm just trying to do what she told me. <laughs> you know? Um, let's continue. Yes. Are there other people on the other side or it's all there? Good, okay. Yes. Uh, my question relates a bit to what you were just talking about. When you work for a company that is above all else, bottom line oriented and process oriented, how do you bring the topic of relationships up to your human resource department, to your manager without coming off, as, without being blown off, first of all, and without coming off as a complainer? Oh, God. Uh, I mean, I, I, look, when I say these things right now, these are not developed answers, right? These are just moments of kind of thinking out loud as a way of giving you a direction. Because I don't know the context and relationships take place in a context. All these conversations, you know, are determined by a number of factors. And here I'm just standing kind of in a vacuum. But there needs to be also a convergence, right? You can't be in a place where you think that everything they stand for is completely against your values. At some point, you need to be able to be true to what matters to you. And that sometimes means making difficult choices. However, I do think that if you go to a place and you say, look, or a person, and you just begin with exactly what you think may go wrong, and you need to say, you know what? I've been thinking about coming to talk to you for a while, and frankly, I'm not so sure that it's a good idea what I'm doing, but I hope you will convince me otherwise. <laughs> then you make the success part of them as well, and it's not just yours, right? Talking to you is a waste of time. Now prove to me that it's not, but done in an elegant way, <laughs> right? It's all about, <laughs> you know. And then you basically say, look, how can one talk about this subject without you thinking that this is about whining and complaining? Is there a way for you that this can be addressed without your, that kind of, the bias that you bring to it? Or without your sense that it comes from people who are always complaining and can't see the good they have and, you know, all of that. Then you make sure to first pump up the positive. You know, there's a quadrant that they talk about in polarity management. Before you try to tell the other person that what they do needs to change, you tell them everything about what they do that is great. Then you tell them everything about how, if they were to change it to what you suggest, would be lost. So you go to that corner. Then you talk about everything that, that if you did it your way, would get lost, and then you come back down to the place of why that would be a good idea for them to try something else. You don't start to convince people to change before you have dealt with what they would experience as loss about changing the way they're doing it, even when they don't think it's working. We get attached to the way we do it. And the risk of novelty or change or different is often bigger than staying stuck. Why we are made up this way, I still don't know. But it is. Yes. Hello, Esther. Yes. So the last question you said, uh, the, the last uh, affirmation you did before answering the questions was that in, the, in order for you to change the other, you need to change yourself. Yes. I think this is basics for psychoanalysis. Everybody who's done therapy knows that. Yes. But why is it so hard? Even though you know that, you have to change yourself to start it, to uh -huh. ignite that. Why me? <laughs> why shall I? Why, why, why not you? Après vous. And something else. Après moi. No. Autre <laughs> question. I'm, I'm also I'm aware of the clock. So, so people it's, know that why isn't do do companies don't have in their HRs yes. people specialized in relationships? Ah, the CRO, the Chief Relationship Officer. <laughs> if you want to hire me, let me know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.